Good evening. Great to see everybody and thank the Lord for the moisture he's given us. We, uh, we appreciate that as well. Um, I don't know what it sounds like out there, but it's real echoey up here. Is my volume up a little higher or do I just have ringing in my ears and I should learn to accept that? Or, I don't know. Anyhow, uh, if you can hear me, that's all that matters. And a special welcome to our folks joining us online. Good to have you folks with us as well. We're celebrating Holy Trinity. And uh, so a lot of our service is going to be focusing on the Trinity, Triune God, including that wonderful, slightly lengthy Athanasian Creed. But we broke it up a little bit, so it's kind of responsive. And it's throughout the, the service as well. And even though our Senate doesn't have anything official for Memorial Weekend, we'll, we'll take at the end of the service just a moment to pause and, and to remember those uh, who, who gave so much for us. Uh, and in our prayers, we will as, as well. Let's start with as we gather. On this Holy Trinity Sunday, we do not so much explain God as confess Him. We testify to Him who has revealed Himself to us. Like Nicodemus of old, we want to know how yet our Lord gives us not the how, but the who. Not the explanation, but the mystery of being big enough to save us. We come today confessing with our fathers in faith the Athanasian Creed, singing, Holy, 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 and rejoicing in the God who is bigger than we are, but who becomes one of us to save us. We'll go ahead and open with our opening hymn, and we'll sing the first three stanzas. Stanzas one, two, and three. Again, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done, by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 
We'll continue by professing our faith in the first part of the Athanasian Creed. Whoever desires to be saved must, above all, hold the Catholic faith. And the Catholic faith is this. We worship one God in Trinity, in Trinity and unity, neither confusing the persons nor dividing the substance. For the Father is one person, the Son is another, and the Holy Spirit is another. But the Godhead of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit is one, the glory equal, the majesty co-eternal. Such as the Father is, such is the Son, and such is the Holy Spirit. The Father uncreated, the Son uncreated, the Holy Spirit uncreated. The, fa the Father infinite, the Son infinite, the Holy Spirit infinite. The Father eternal, the Son eternal, the Holy Spirit. And yet there are not three eternals, but one eternal. Just as there are not three uncreated, or three infinities, but one uncreated and one infinite. In the same way, the Father is almighty, the Son almighty, and the Holy Spirit almighty. And yet there are not three almighties, but one. So the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. And yet there are not three gods, but one God. So the Father is Lord, the Son is Lord, and the Holy Spirit is Lord. And yet there are not three lords, but one Lord. We continue with our our uh, hymn of praise, let's go ahead and sing stanzas one, two, and seven. How's that? One, two, and seven. <laughs> you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you have given us grace to acknowledge the glory of the eternal Trinity by the confession of a true faith and to worship the unity and the power of the divine majesty. Keep us steadfast in this faith and defend us from all adversities. For you, O Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, live and reign one God now and forever. Amen. 
Today is Holy Trinity, the first Sunday after Pentecost, the, first, uh, the festival half of the church year, which has confessed the saving events in the life of our Lord, now gives way to that part of the church year in which we hear his teaching. From the Old Testament reading from Isaiah, we witness a glimpse of the glory of the Lord, the God of Sabaoth, whose power is chiefly known in showing mercy. In the epistle from the Acts of the Apostles, we hear another part of the Pentecost sermon of Peter attesting to the revelation of Jesus as both Lord and Christ. In the Gospel according to John, we hear Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus. And within this, we hear the most beloved and familiar verses of Scripture.
Old Testament reading from the book of Isaiah, the sixth chapter. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal, and he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, your guilt is taken away, and, you sin, and your sin atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. This is the word of the Lord. Our epistle from the book of Acts. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst. As you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your holy ones see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your, for your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his, one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. This is the word of the Lord. Please stand as you are able for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the third chapter. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? 
Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Jesus said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord Christ. You may be seated. Hello, boys and girls. Today I want to talk to you about something we call the Trinity. We use that word Trinity to talk about God. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. That's three in one. It's impossible to understand. None of us really understand it, but the Bible tells us that the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. So I have an illustration that I think will help. I have an apple. Now this is just one apple, but there are three parts to this apple. There is the outside part that's all red. We call it the skin. But I'm going to cut the apple open, and you see that there's the fruit part of the apple, the white part. That's the yummy part to eat. It's still one apple, but it's got skin, and it's got the fruit. But there's also a part of the apple, and that's the core. I'm going to take a couple seeds out, and we can look at them on a white plate. Look at these white seeds. Can you see that? One rolled off, but this is all still one apple. The seeds, the good part to eat, and the red skin. It's one apple, but three parts. That's not a perfect illustration, but it kind of helps us think about God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. One God. Let's pray about that. Lord, we don't understand everything about you, but we love you and we thank you for teaching us all about you, that you are truly the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God. In the name of Jesus, we pray this. Amen. We'll continue with stanzas one through four, one through four of our hymn of the day.
Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. So this evening, we we're focusing on the Trinity. It is Trinity Sunday celebration after all. And, and on Trinity Sunday, we have the, the joy, no, the privilege of getting to confess the Athanasian Creed. It's hard to say with a straight face. It is a little bit long. Maybe, maybe that's one of the reasons that, you know, we really love that John 3.16 verse. It's short and it's to the point. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should have eternal life and not perish or never perish, but have eternal life. That's simply what we believe. I know. But yet... For most of us, many of us anyhow, there are times, maybe, maybe late at night as we're lying awake thinking about our faith, where we, we struggle, maybe have doubts, or maybe at least questions. And you might even think of some of the things you heard at church or you read in the Bible, or maybe you recall a Sunday school lesson or two and you think, is that right? Is that really how it is? The story of Nicodemus shouldn't be an odd story because it is our story, in a sense. A man who struggles with his faith. Now, if you met him on the street, he'd seem like a great guy, really. I mean, he, he's a Jew among Jews. He had a faith story that went all the way back to Abraham. He was a teacher of Israel. He was a, a member, we're told, of the Jewish ruling counselors. Well, he's a, a Pharisee after all. Which means he had answers. He kept the rules. He knew the rituals. He, he was also missing something in his faith. He wanted more. He wanted a faith that was relevant. He wanted a faith with punch. And this Jesus seemed to, to have it. And so we're told he goes late at night, I suppose not to be seen by anyone, and he seeks out Jesus. Because what do you want? He wanted a living faith. So he goes to Jesus, presumably to talk about religion, and, and quite frankly, it's interesting, because he doesn't really have a question. He just goes to Jesus and he shares an observation. He said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher that has come from God because no one can do the things that you do if God were not with him. We see that Nicodemus is rather respectful to Jesus and respectful, I suppose, about his teachings. But Nicodemus is searching for something and I think there are a lot of people today who are still searching for something. He wants a faith, a faith that means something, a faith that does something, a faith that adds context to his life and his purpose therein. In fact, that is a question that I believe people struggle with still today. God loves me, so what? Jesus died for me. So what? You know, Nicodemus, he didn't need to be convinced by Jesus that there was a God. He, he believed in God. He didn't need to be convinced that God created the heavens and the earth. Yeah, he, he believed that. He didn't need to be convinced that Scripture was true and God breathed. Yeah, he kind of figured God wrote those words. Now, his question was kind of a so what? He wanted more than just a comfortable pew to sit in. He wanted more than a few rituals of when to stand and when to sit. He, he wanted more than a few Bible verses that he had to memorize in a confirmation class. He wanted a faith that was real. He wanted a taste of God. And I shouldn't even say a faith that was real. He wanted a faith that added meaning for his life. And the question is, 
Do you ever feel that way? Or maybe I shouldn't say, do you ever feel that way? How often have we felt that feeling? Kind of like our faith is bogged down. That your religion, your church, the programs we offer, they're not bad, but they're just not enough. And sometimes we we even ask ourselves, are, are we just going through the motions of worship? Are you looking for some power in your life? Are you looking for some joy from your faith? Are you looking for some life in your faith? Then, my friends, maybe you need to slip away some night and have a little talk with Jesus. In the story in John 2, just before John 3, obviously, but just before the story of Nicodemus, St. John wrote about Jesus these words. He says of Jesus, he knew all men and he knew what was in a man. That's really useful to be able to know what it is that a person's coming to you to talk about and to know where they're coming from. And Jesus did. He knows the struggles in Nicodemus' heart. He knows us, too. He knows the struggles that we have in our heart. He knows our motives. He knows our desires. He knows our inner thoughts. He knows our secrets. And though that might terrify us at times, and in some ways it's beautiful because all those things he knows about, he came to die for and to pay for on the cross. And he loves us all the same. Jesus didn't need to talk to Nicodemus, nor to us about rethinking our religious views or changing our attitudes or cleaning up our act. He didn't give Nicodemus a pep talk. He didn't say, come on, buddy, just just try a little harder. You know, you can keep those commandments. Have a little more faith. Do a few more good works. Just increase your giving. Show up for all the events. Pay more attention to the sermons. I don't know. He might have said that. I don't know. Anyhow. Now, what does Jesus say? He says, I tell you the truth. No one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. What an odd thing to respond with. Nicodemus just says, hey, you do a lot of cool stuff. You must be from God. And the response is, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. Born again. Well, what's that require? Well, I guess it's to imply a complete change, right? Everything different. A new heart, a new life. And it sounds drastic. And Nicodemus probably wondered, is my problem really that serious? Maybe we wonder, is that even possible? To be born again? To start over? Now, Nicodemus, we almost can empathize with him, can't we? He takes those words literally and he He obviously doesn't understand all his theological training. It doesn't help him. And he says to Jesus, how can a man be born when he's old? Surely he can't enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born again. It made no sense to him, this talk of Jesus. But stop for a minute and think. How good would it be to start over? To have a second chance, only this time to do things right, or at least this time do things differently. It's uh, the season of graduation, right? East High's having their graduation this weekend. Lots of schools have already had their graduation. You know what the last thing a high school graduate wants to hear? Hey, how would you like to go back to kindergarten and start over? (laughs) Uh, You you don't want to hear those words. But what if you did? What if you did school over? What if you did college over, graduate school, whatever you did? Would you do things different? Maybe. Maybe. Maybe studied a little harder in geography, learned math a little better, paid attention to what the English teacher was trying to teach you when it came to grammar. You know, there may come a day when all of us wish we'd have paid a little more attention in confirmation, focused on some of those biblical truths that we were being taught. But the truth is we can't. The past cannot be undone. As the saying goes, what is written is written. There is no erasing what's in life. It stands, it is, is, and there really is no way to change that. 
So I can understand at least a little bit of what Nicodemus is saying. How? How can a man be born again when he is old? And Jesus says, I tell you the truth. No one will enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and of the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, and the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. What Jesus is really saying is, you cannot in your flesh undo it. No, you're right. You've messed up. You simply can't change drastically enough to be good enough for God, to enter the kingdom of God. You can't go back and take back words you said or say words you should have said or do things we should have done or not do things we did. You can't, right? And obviously we can't enter into our mother's womb and be born again. So that's not possible. What Jesus is sharing, and especially when he gets to the end of our text, is that the good news is Jesus did it for us. He did the work. He gives us the new birth through water and the Spirit. And of course, we receive that in holy baptism. That's why, especially we Lutherans, we spend a lot of time talking about what we call sacramental theology, about baptism. It's a big deal. We say it's a gift from God. We baptize in the name of the Holy Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And it means we actually believe that when someone is baptized, they are born again. In Titus 3, St. Paul wrote, He saved us not because of righteous things we had done, but because of His mercy. He saved us through the washing and rebirth of the renewal of the Spirit, whom He poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified by grace, we might become heirs of everlasting hope and life. You yeah, might not remember, but you had to memorize that in confirmation. That's a big deal to us. It is a promise that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you get eternal life. St. Paul confirms this writings in Corinthians when he says, If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. All this is from God who, is who has reconciled us to himself. You know what you are, folks? You're born-again Christians. Now, I know sometimes that connotation hasn't always been well-received, but that's what you are. You're born-again Christians. We are evangelical, Holy Spirit-filled Christians. That's a little bit what we were talking about last week, right? You should not, Jesus says, you should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows where it pleases. You hear the sound, but you can't tell where it's coming from. You can't tell where it's going. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. The Spirit is actually working in every single one of you tonight. You may not feel it, but faith isn't a feeling. It's a trust. It's relying on Jesus Christ as your Savior. The Spirit works in you even when you can't see Him. You can't see the wind, but you know the effects. If you were out last night late, you heard that wind. You know it was real. You heard the rain, even if you couldn't see it in the dark. The Holy Spirit is working that way too. I think the Spirit changed Nicodemus. I do. I think, you know, we only really know about Nicodemus a couple of times. Remember when the Jewish ruling council was arguing about Jesus? It was Nicodemus who stood up and said, hey, now wait a minute, if it's not of God, don't worry. You know. It'll pass, but if it's of God, let's not fight it. And then who goes after Jesus dies? It's Nicodemus. He goes to help make preparations again. Did Nicodemus believe? I think so. I think he did. And you, my friends, shouldn't be surprised that the Spirit can bring about that same kind of change in you and in me and in anyone and everyone, really, we believe in God, but to be born of the Spirit means that our faith is vital and powerful. We worship regularly, but to be born in the Spirit means it's not just a dull routine. It is a joyous praise. We've got programs, events, things to volunteer for at church. But to be born of the Spirit means that we know that the things we're doing are useful, are helpful, are important. 
that the Lord's work does make a difference, that it does bring about a change in this world. You see, it's the Holy Spirit that gives context to our faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Now may the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, give our, keep our hearts and minds safe in Christ Jesus. Amen. We continue confessing our faith in the words of the Athanasian Creed, part two. Just as we are compelled by the Christian truth to acknowledge each distinct person as God and Lord, so also are we prohibited by the Catholic religion to say that there are three gods or lords. Father is not made nor created or begotten by any. The Son is neither made nor created but begotten of the Father alone. The Holy Spirit is of the Father and of the Son, neither made nor created nor begotten, but proceeding. Thus there is one Father, not three fathers, one Son, not three sons, one Holy Spirit, not three Holy Spirits. And is greater but the whole three persons are co-eternal with each other and co-equal, so that in all things, as has been stated above, the Trinity and unity and unity and Trinity is to be worshipped. Therefore, whoever desires to be saved must think about the Trinity. We continue with the prayers of the church, but I tell you what I'm going to do, not to mess things up. Uh, I didn't get the prayers put up here. Yeah, I need those prayers right there. So uh, could we maybe sing the offertory while Justin runs the prayers up to me? I appreciate it. I printed them out and put them back there. I never brought it here. Or we'll just... Yeah. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Lord of hosts, your ways are inscrutable and your judgments unsearchable. Through your word, give us an ever-growing understanding of the depths of your riches, wisdom, and knowledge that we may glorify you forever. You give us the gift of love for one another. And so we celebrate the anniversary of Daryl and Darlene Kruger, 66 years. Lord, in your mercy, Lord of hosts, you gave your only Son 
that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Bless the work of missionaries as they carry this gospel to the ends of the earth, that many may hear of your love in your Son and be saved through him. Lord, in your mercy. Lord of hosts, have mercy on those who deny the new birth of water and the spirit to infants and children. Open their eyes and hearts to the fullness of your grace, that they would no longer hinder these little ones from being born again and seeing your kingdom. Lord, in your mercy. Lord of hosts, we give thanks for those who have served our nation through military service. And we remember with gratitude those who gave their lives for us and for the cause of freedom. Help us to honor their sacrifice by using our liberty responsibly. Keep safe all who travel, bless our nation, help us to protect and increase the privileges we have for those who follow us, looking always to you from whom these privileges come. Lord, in your mercy. Lord of hosts, uphold all who are ill and in need of your healing and comfort. For all who suffer in our midst by your truth, by your truth, that since you are at the right hand, they cannot be shaken. Gladden their hearts, cause their tongues to rejoice, and make their flesh dwell in hope. Lord, in your mercy. All these things and whatever else you know that we need, grant us, Father, for the sake of him who died and rose again and now lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We continue with the proclamation of Christ. O blessed and holy Trinity, guide us into all truth and guard us as your own possession, that we be sustained in faith through persecution and trouble. Manifest the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace and be found worthy of eternal life when our Lord comes as judge and king of all. Through him, with him, and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, both now and forever. Amen. Hear us as we pray in the name of Jesus and with the words he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We continue with the third and final part of the Athanasian Creed. But it is also necessary for everlasting salvation that one faithfully believe the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is right faith that we believe and confess that our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is the same time both God. He is God, begotten from the substance of the Father before all ages, and he is man, born from the substance of his mother in this age. Perfect God and perfect man, composed of a rational soul and human flesh. Equal to the Father with respect to his divinity, less than the Father with respect to his humanity. Although he is God and man, he is not two but one Christ. One, however, not by the conversion of the divinity into flesh, but by the assumption of the humanity into God. One altogether, not by confusion of substance, but by unity of person. For as the rational soul and flesh is one man, so God and man in one Christ, who suffered for our salvation, sent into hell, rose again the third day from the dead. Ascended into heaven and seated at the right hand of the Father, God Almighty, from whence he will come to judge the living and the dead. At his coming, all people rise again with their bodies and give an account concerning their own. And those who have done good will enter into eternal life, and those who have done evil into eternal fire. This is the Catholic faith. Moreover, faithfully, firmly, cannot be saved. I would like to take just a moment and to kind of silence, remember just what sacrifices have been made for us to have the freedoms we have in our country.
The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. Go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. We'll go ahead and sing. I will sing all four stanzas of Holy, Holy, Holy. Good to see everybody in church tonight. By the way, we call the Athanasian Creed because there was a smart guy named Athanasius, and he had a school. I don't think Athanasius had anything to do with writing this creed, but his students did. And uh, we don't even know exactly what date. But uh, as you can tell, it's not just long. It was refuting some heresies. In other words, there were people saying things about Jesus that weren't true. And so they had this statement to say, uh-huh, this is the truth. And of course, the Catholic Church is not as you might think of Roman Catholic Church that you see around town. The word Catholic just means universal. So it's saying the universal church. Probably should explain that before we even confess it. But anyhow, a um, couple of things here. And uh, I do, before we go, want to want to thank Bonnie uh, and Gary for being so flexible. You know, when we pastors jump around, very hard on those trying to follow us. It reminds me, when I was a kid, we, we used dirt bikes all the time, and we would race around, and somebody would be the leader, and he'd basically try to lose the ones behind him. So we'd zip around on the motorcycles. Eventually, we would get, he would lose us. That's pretty much probably what people trying to follow the pastors think. It's like, oh, man. <laughs> Anyhow, um, thanks for sticking with me. Hey, a couple of things I want to announce. The LWML always takes mites offerings on the fifth Sunday of the month, and this will be a fifth Sunday. So as you exit church, you know we have offering stands. We don't pass plates anymore. 
at uh, both entrances, and we also have some LWML boxes out. So you can put uh, any mites, loose change, dollars, whatever in, in there. That would be wonderful. We have rhubarb, fresh rhubarb pies. I think I saw one was custard, and, and uh, I don't know. It has a lot of sugar. I know that, and that's wonderful. So they are for sale, and what the fundraiser is is to help St. Paul's school. That's why we've been selling steaks and selling these pies, because uh, we're trying to help the school out and keep it... Uh, Keep it going in a wonderful fashion like it does. I really don't have any other announcements. Are there any announcements that need to be made? If there are not, great to see you all. God bless your week.